The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 1496 in the name of Angus Macdonald on State of Nature 2016 report. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Would those members who wish to speak in the debate please press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Angus Macdonald to open the debate around seven minutes, please, Mr Macdonald. Thank you, uh, President Officer. Firstly, can I say how grateful I am to uh, fellow members from across the Chamber for supporting my motion, uh, which has allowed the State of Nature Scotland report to be debated in the Chamber this evening. Uh, I'm grateful to the Minister for standing in for the Cabinet Secretary, who's uh, been at COP22 in Marrakesh as well. Um, I felt it was important to try to secure a, a debate in the Chamber on this issue, as the State of Nature report features information critical to understanding the status of our natural environment, highlighting the state of biodiversity across eight different types of habitats found in Scotland. And on the surface, uh, the report is far from ideal. In the UK, overall, 56% of 4,000 species in the UK declined between 1970 and 2013. And this decline was 53% between 2002 and 2013. In Scotland, 520 or 9% of species are classified as at risk of extinction and the report identifies the main threats to biodiversity as climate change, diminished management of farming, urbanisation and non-native invasive species. Altogether, these factors contribute to placing Scotland in the bottom quarter of the world for biodiversity intactness. Taking this into account, it's vital to recognise that measures must be taken to preserve and regrow what biodiversity we have. And good work is already going on, as we all know, so it's not through the, the lack of trying. The State of Nature report also recognises measures that can be uh, and have been taken to transform Scotland into a global leader in species conservation. It highlights the importance of well-planned, targeted and adequately resourced conservation action and of collaboration between the Scottish Government, NGOs and local land managers, uh, to name just a few. There are examples all across Scotland of groups implementing actions to substantially improved biodiversity and I'm pleased to say there are a number of examples from my own constituency in Falkirk East which involves volunteers from across Falkirk District. Communities along the Caron Association or CATCA as they are known locally is a group comprising mainly of volunteers committed to the rege regeneration of the River Caron, the communities which run, run along the river and the land adjacent to it. Set up in 2010, CATCA along with several other partners and stakeholders including SNH, Falkirk Council, Central Scotland Green Network and the Scottish Government Climate Challenge Fund have embarked upon a programme of environmental improvement projects involving schools, community groups, marginalised groups and unemployed adults with various health related issues, which include the clearing of litter and log jams to allow the river to flow freely and increase the chances of wildlife repopulating, the improvement of path networks along the River Cairn Corridor for access and recreation and biodiversity projects, all of which are vital to the environment of this important area. Building partnerships with these agencies to allow people who are unemployed to gain skills and experience through this work in order to get themselves back on their feet and increase their employability is important and demonstrates that our natural landscape not only supports wildlife, but it supports jobs and economic development too. And that projects like this one with CATCA, eh, the Scottish Government and other relevant parties is central to sustaining our extensive natural resources and our economy. But it doesn't end there, President Officer. In my constituency, we also have the Scottish Wildlife Trust's Jupiter Wildlife Park, which sits cheek by jowl with the agrochemical and petrochemical industries in the heart of Grangemouth. It's been a tremendous success and celebrates its 25th birthday or anniversary next May. And in the past two months alone, it's attracted 15 secondary school visits and often has vis events for children in the summer, which are so popular they're fully booked with waiting lists. In fact, the Minister uh, will recall uh, that the Scottish Government were so impressed with the work going on at Jupiter that in his previous role as Environment Minister, I was clearly back in the job for 10 minutes, uh, <laughs> uh, he launched the Scottish Biodiversity Strategy there in the summer of 2013, along with children from Grangemouth Sacred Heart Primary School. So if the Minister wouldn't mind passing on an invitation to the Cabinet Secretary while she's reacclimatising following her a visit to Marrakesh, uh, I and the Scottish Wildlife Trust would be delighted if she could join us in Grangemouth in May to celebrate the 25th anniversary 
of the Jupiter Wildlife Park. And then, of course, there is the Inner Forth Landscape Initiative, which is an exciting programme of work that, that is conserving, enhancing and celebrating the unique landscape and heritage of the upper reaches of the Firth of Forth, with 50 discrete but interrelated projects taking place around the Inner Forth area. Further afield, at least from my constituency, an example given within the State of Nature report is the actions taken by the RSPB to realign the coast of Nig Bay. Nig Bay lost over 35% of salt marsh and mudflats between 1946 and 97, and the RSPB pioneered a project in 2003 to rectify this, reconnecting Medit Marsh, uh, Medit Marsh with the sea for the first time since the 1950s. Within a year, several species of salt marsh plants and mud-dwelling invertebrates had recolonised the newly reformed salt marsh, and by 2011, the marsh had been completely transformed into its original state of salt marsh and intertidal mudflats. This project is just one instance of where focused action can have a significant positive impact on biodiversity for a, a range of Scottish wildlife. In order to build on actions like those taken at Nig Bay, we must all work together, along with the Scottish Government, NGOs, and local volunteers to see widespread change across our country, not just in isolated areas. Will we accept an intervention? Indeed. Kenneth Gibbs, stand up, please, Mr. Gibbs. I've been absolutely fascinated, actually, by what's happening, actually, in your constituency. Uh, Mr. Gibson, your microphone's not on. Have you got your card in? It is, indeed. Uh, is. Yeah. Give it a wee dunt. A wee dunt. There you go. High tech. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, thank you for accepting the intervention. I've been fascinated by hearing what you've been saying about your constituency. I'm sure you'll be aware that uh, uh, in this week's uh, new uh, scientist indicates that uh, globally uh, our nature is fall reducing by 2% a year and two-thirds of all wildlife has become uh, it has died off over the last uh, 40 years as a global extinction uh, uh, that we're facing. So what can Scotland actually do, not just locally, but globally, to actually lead the kind of uh, fight back for nature uh, in order to restore some of the environment that our species has destroyed in recent years? OK, well, I, I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't seen the New Scientist uh, report, um, but I will try and catch it later and get back to the member once, uh, once I've had a good read of it. Um, the report presents a number of warnings about Scotland's biodiversity, but it's important to note that it's not a, a hopeless case. It's still possible for Scotland to become a world leader in biodiversity and environmental protection, um, which addresses the point that, uh, that you raised. The, the Scottish Government clearly recognises the importance of taking these actions and has the 2020 route map lined out to improve biodiversity and to connect Scots with their natural heritage. This is a commitment to ensuring that the environment works together with the economy to maximise the benefits to Scotland in a sustainable way. Um, if we are to see this plan come to fruition, however, we must act and safeguard vital funding to protect our wildlife and that we all work together to best utilise our collective talents and efforts. If action is not taken, we can see wildlife which improves the quality of our lives and our posterity become extinct. Uh, I'm well aware that I'm running out of time, Stein officer, so... Um, in conclusion, uh, Scotland's biodiversity must be made a top priority. It's too valuable to, to act otherwise. Not only does our natural environment help sustain 14% of Scotland's jobs, but it also provides other benefits, clearly such as cleaner, water, uh, cleaner air, cleaner water and uh, local flood prevention. Protections for biodiversity go hand in hand to achieve this and we must all do our part to work together to protect this valuable part of Scotland's natural history. Thank you. I now move to the open speeches. Speeches of around four minutes, please. Morris Golden to be followed by Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I'd like to congratulate Angus MacDonald on securing this debate on the State of Nature 2016 report. This report should act as a wake-up call for Scotland Time and again, in this report, we see evidence of a decline in Scotland's biodiversity and natural heritage. And we need to see both leadership and a redoubling of efforts on the ground if we are to safeguard and enhance Scotland's wildlife. Mm. There is a lot to digest in this report, but one thing stands out above all others, and it makes for grim reading. Almost 10% of Scotland's species are at risk of extinction. This is an alarming figure, and the detail of it is no less grim. 
27% of bird species were assessed as being at highest conservation risk and almost half showing long-term decline. 13% of plant species are at risk of extinction and more than half of all Scottish species studied have declined since 1970. On top of this, our native woodland fares little better with native Caledonian forest covering barely more than 6% of its original area. Summing it all up is Scotland's rating on the Biodiversity Intactness Index. Of the 218 countries assessed, Scotland ranks 36th from bottom, placing Scotland in the bottom fifth of all countries. That simply isn't good enough. More attention needs to be given to protected areas, which not only help in preserving our biodiversity, but also deliver economic and social benefits. Yet despite this, a fifth of designated natural features remain in an unfavourable condition. The message is clear. Scotland is facing a biodiversity crisis. Actions must follow, which means ensuring that the necessary capacity and resources are in place to properly manage our natural environment. This is something that has not always been evident, as we can see uh, from the Biodiversity 2020 Progress Report. So what do we do about it? Well, information is the key to tackling these problems. I noted with interest that the report mentions that the RSPB's ability to measure relevant data is better at a UK level. So agencies and governments should work together to ensure the close cooperation and share resources where possible. In Scotland specifically though, a good step would be for SNH to look at developing a monitoring system to measure the impact conservation is having on designated features. Then we can benchmark sites as we work towards moving them to a more favourable condition. We must also look to the future and beyond the Biodiversity 2020 strategy we can't afford to be complacent, and I agree with the RSPB when they call upon the Scottish Government to set out their sights on ambitious targets for Scotland up to 2030. We must all ensure that when it comes to our natural heritage, Scotland's reach will always exceed its grasp. Thank you. Claudia Beamish to be followed by Graham Day. Thank you, Presiding Officer. May I offer my thanks to Angus Macdonald for raising such an interesting and important topic for debate tonight. And can I just give my apologies for having to leave after speaking this evening. I welcome the publication of the State of Nature 2016 report, continuing the assessment of our wildlife. Collaborative efforts like these demonstrate the value of knowledge sharing, and it is thanks to the partnership of the 50 UK-wide organisations that we have evidence and opportunity to accurately assess the gaps in which nature is being let down. The comprehensive piece of work reveals some deeply concerning figures which I expect may surprise many people. The unhappy, unhappy headlines are that Scotland is ranked in the lowest fifth of all countries analysed in the Biodiversity and Tactness Index, and almost one in ten Scottish species are at risk of extinction. As MSPs, we speak proudly of the natural beauty of our regions. And over the summer, I was delighted to visit Glen Lude in the Borders and the Nethan Gorge in the Clyde Valley, home to green woodpeckers, otters, and badgers. Scotland's nature is a right everyone should enjoy, and it is evident that collective efforts must be heightened to protect it. Evidence suggests that the Scottish Government's route map to 2020 is insufficient to deliver the ACCI targets. It is a shame that the Scottish Government will not be able to attend the Conference of Parties on the Convention on Biolog Biological Diversity next month, and I'm interested to know what steps the Government has taken to report progress in Scotland towards these targets at, uh, to the COP and how it intends to ensure that it is in a position to implement any agreements reached there. I have spoken before about the need to apply a marine perspective to discussions and debates on, the, on biodiversity like today's. 
And along with Angus MacDonald, I recognise the RSPB's work at Nig Bay and elsewhere on this. Climate change and human activity are damaging and altering the distribution and composition of marine species, both under the water and those flying above it. Over the short term, the report states that 50% of marine species have declined, but more optimistically, 50% have increased. But this is a complex picture, and Scottish seabirds are globally important, but climate change and mismanagement has seen a serious decline in some species, including Arctic tern numbers, plummeting by around 70%. Migrating food supplies, non-native species, and disturbed nesting and mating areas have all taken a toll on seabird colonies. The network of marine protected areas has been a progressive step towards sustainable Scottish seeds and should be celebrated. However, gaps remain, both in the charting of areas for protection and within the 2020 route map. Biodiversity thinking should not focus on MPA sites alone, in my view. It should be applied to the other 84% of Scotland's seas. Furthermore, regional, uh, regional marine planning is crucial to, maintain, to enhancing as well as maintaining biodiversity in our seas and must be adequately resourced. Effective and cooperative management on land and sea will be central towards moving towards the ACCI targets and an ambitious action plan for 2030. The changing climate is one of the greatest threats to our marine ecosystems, but conversely, our oceans are one of the greatest natural tools we have to tackle global warming. Blue carbon refers to stocks of carbon sequestrated by marine habitats, in some cases keeping out of our atmosphere for thousands of years. And I know the, um, the, the minister has had involvement with that in, um, in a previous role, and I hope to see this being taken forward in the new low carbon plan. Improving understanding of this phenomenon by developing an evidence-based and monitoring system will be significant in delivering our national and global climate change targets. Thank you. Graham Day, followed by John Scott. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, as is customary, let me begin by congratulating my friend and Environment Committee colleague, Angus Macdonald, for bringing forward this debate. Uh, just last week in this chamber, I led members' business on the relaunch of Scottish Environment Link Species Champions Programme. It's heartening a matter of days later to see Scotland's biodiversity once again being the subject of Parliament's attention, because the, the health and the balance of our natural environment is hugely important. That's why earlier this month the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee brought stakeholders together to consider just what progress has been made towards meeting our protection and restoration targets and where further action is required. We reflected upon the content of the State of Nature 2016 report for Scotland, setting that alongside the findings of SNH's route map to 2020 progress report and explored possible contradictions between the findings of the two. The sense I got from the session, I suspect committee colleagues would agree, is that while progress has been made, there is so much more to be done, both in terms of having a more complete set of indicators and addressing some specific threats. A letter from the committee will be winging its way to the Cabinet Secretary, offering its thoughts on these matters, and as convener, I would not want to preempt its content. There were, of course, however, a, a number of concerns identified by stakeholders, but amidst the concerns, and issues highlighted. It was heartening to hear that progress is being made in at least one area of real contention, that of Muirburn. Presiding officer, Muirburn, its possible merits and demerits, is a fascinating subject, I promise you. One which maybe highlights another further complication in all of this, the absence of objective and comprehensive science to inform how we best take forward efforts to improve biodiversity and, in this particular case, sequestrate carbon. Such as my own interest in the subject, I recently spent a Saturday afternoon poring over a series of scientific papers on the issue, illustrating perhaps, as my children said, the rock and roll lifestyle of an MSP. I wanted to get a definitive sense of the benefits or otherwise in carbon storage and biodiversity terms, but actually was left little the wiser than when I embarked upon the process. So I was pleased to hear stakeholders speaking positively about the opportunity they've had through the Moorland Forum to feed into the restructuring of the Muirburn Code, which hopefully will see us come to a way forward which takes appropriately balanced account of peatland, soil, vegetation and avian biodiversity. Because, presiding officer, we will only make the progress we need to on biodiversity through genuine partnership working 
in all its forms. And if we need evidence of that, we only need to look at the hugely welcome news last week that Golden Eagle numbers across Scotland are at almost historic levels, with a 15 per cent increase since 2003, taking us to an estimated 508 payers. Many across government agencies, charities and, yes, the land management sector have played their part in that achievement, and we should pay tribute to their efforts. That study, however, also threw up some very concerning findings. The absence of golden eagles in the eastern Cairngorms is an issue that simply cannot be ignored, especially given the previously identified disappearance of eight tagged birds in the general area. But let me finish on an optimistic note, presiding officer. Yes, it is hugely concerning that of the 6,000 species studied by the State of Nature report, 504 are deemed to be at risk of becoming extinct. Uh, but there are, as it's noted in the RSPB briefing for this debate, and I quote, many inspiring examples of conservation action that is helping to turn the tide. And with such active and effective wildlife organisations as we have here in Scotland, set alongside an environment committee that within months of being established has already been shining a light on the biodiversity issue and will continue to do so. And a cabinet secretary who everyone acknowledges has a knowledge and a passion for our national uh, natural environment. I think we can and will make the progress we without doubt need to. And of course, running parallel to that, we look to the 59 MSPs who have signed up as species champions to play their part also. Presiding officer. John Scott, followed by David Stewart. Thank you, presiding officer. And may I begin by declaring an interest as a farmer, a food producer, and given Graham Day's uh, speech, uh, a muir burner of past as well, and refer members to my register of interest. And can I also congratulate Angus MacDonald on securing this debate. Presiding officer, our precious environment has been most shaped in recent times, firstly by the last ice age and then man in more recent times. What we regard as our unique and identifiably Scottish landscape is massively the product of geology, latitude, proximity to the Atlantic, prevailing winds and climate change. Man's influence has always been secondary and will remain so, but that does not mean it is unimportant. And in recent times, since the Second World War, which we were nearly starved out of by German U-boats, the drive in the United Kingdom and Scotland was to massively increase food production. Never again should we allow ourselves to become so vulnerable and dependent on importing food. And so the dash to increase food production defined our post-war efforts in relation to our land through the 1950s, 60s and 70s until 1983, with butter mountains and milk lakes emerging across Europe, the dash for food production came to a grinding halt. And since 1983, support mechanisms have concentrated more on environmental objectives and less on food production, and rightly so. Hedges are no longer ripped out. Peat bogs are no longer drained as other considerations take precedence that of restoring, repairing and enhancing at least some of the habitats damaged in the dash for food production. Of course, arguments will continue about food security because both Scotland and the United Kingdom are still far short of self-sufficiency in terms of food production. As for the last 40 years, our food production and environmental objectives have been driven by a collective European view, a position, though, which is about to change dramatically. So land use goals in the UK and Scotland could change again in the medium to long term here in the UK, but that's a debate for another day. Meantime, we must focus on continuing to enhance and rebuild habitats. We must note that our biodiversity intactness index, as highlighted in the State of Nature report in Scotland, is 81%, which puts us in Scotland 36th from the bottom of a list of 218 countries which have been evaluated. In other words, we are in the bottom fifth of this global index, as Maurice Golden has said, not a good place to be. We have lost 44% of Scotland's blanket peat bog. Broadleafed and mixed woodland has fallen by 23 and 37% respectively, and natural and semi-natural grasslands cover less than 1% of our land area. These and other factors have led, as others have said, to 9% of our species being at risk, which puts 18% of butterflies, 15% of dragonflies, and 12% of our mosses, hornworts, and liverworts being at risk of extinction here in Scotland. 
red-listed species in recent times include the curlew and dotterel, as well as the kittiwake and puffin. On the plus side, overwintering wild goose populations have more than trebled since 1990, which of course brings its own problems for affected farmers, yet wader populations have declined by 50%. But seabirds too have generally declined by 38% since monitoring began in 1986. So what's to be done? I, to be frank, I think we are pursuing the right course of action, as the report suggests. We just need to do more of it. Species numbers have always risen and fallen in our land and marine environment, with extinction of species taking place long before man's influence. Of course, if we could maintain and support all of our existing species worldwide, that would be welcomed. But it would also deny the existence of the evolutionary process. So, at its simplest, we must limit where we can man's destructive influence on our different habitats, restore and replenish when we can, and encourage the custodians of our seas and our landscapes, of whom I am one, to do the right thing where possible. I am therefore delighted to have taken part in this debate today and support Angus Macdonald's motion. Thank you. David Stewart to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I also congratulate uh, Angus Macdonald for securing uh, today's debate. The State of Nature Report for Scotland is, of course, a significant and comprehensive piece of research by 50 leading wildlife organisations. The UK 2013 report was, of course, groundbreaking, and it has been followed up in 2016 with a more in-depth look, including a breakdown across the home nations, meaning we can begin to understand even more about the current state of our nature. However, as substantial as this document is, what it has to say is, of course, a great wake-up call. More than half of Scottish species have declined since the 1970s, 520 species in Scotland are at risk of extinction, and another 6,000, as we've heard, remain on the red list for at risk. Climate change has already had a severely damaging effect on our native species and biodiversity. Changing climates have disrupted uh, mating patterns, hibernation and adaptation lead to decline in population. And changing and intensifying land management and land use has also led to much decline and damage of our biodiversity. Uh, as the species champion of the great yellow bumblebee, I spoke only last week about how intensification of farming and grazing and the decline in traditional crofting practices has meant the species that used to be found across the whole of the UK is now found on a few of the Scottish islands with a tiny population on the North Highland mainland. But it isn't just about declining species. More broadly, Scotland is ranked, again as we've heard, in the lowest fifth of countries for our biodiversity and tactless index. Our ecosystems have fallen below the point at which they can reliably meet society's needs. And the maintenance and restoration of our ecosystem is vital to help the decline to support our flora, our fauna and human population but also to balance our carbon budget and enable Scotland to reach our greenhouse gas reduction targets. To do so, we need, we need to do the following. Support the recovery of the species population, improve habitat quality, and develop green corridors between fragmented areas of natural land. Creation of a nat uh, national ecology network would go a long way towards improving the condition of our natural environment. Small scale changes could be urban green roofs, more tree-lined streets and more grass left for wildflowers, to big changes like the incredibly vital restoration of peatlands, as we, again as we've heard, and an increase in protected areas. We need to put the same amount of effort into our green planning as we do into our grey planning. Green corridors would mean increasing isolated semi-natural landscapes and the species that live in them could be connected, cultivating a highway for wildlife to travel and increasing resilience to climate change. The truth is, we already know how to restore and support our biodiversity and ecosystems. We also know what the main threats are. We need now to ensure that the policy, the regulation and firm decisive action is taken to prioritise the health of our natural environment. This is urgent. The State of Nature report focuses mainly on the recent and ongoing issues. But the sad truth, Poseidon Officer, is that the damage has been going on for years, indeed decades. Our nation is much poorer in nature. As many have said in the past, we do not own the environment, we keep it in trust for our children. The report has started at a baseline that already shows how much damage has been done. 
The Scottish Government have, of course, international commitment to halt the decline of our environment under the Convention of the Consultation of Biological Diversity. Their report, Scotland's Biodiversity, a route map to 2020, runs out in three years. We have to look at the bigger, longer picture. This will not be resolved overnight. In the words of Barack Obama, our generation may not live to see the full realisation of what we do here, but the knowledge that the next generation will be better off for what we do here, can you imagine a more worthy reward than that? It seems odd that despite knowing how important care for environment is, we seem as a society to be reluctant to implement and take it forward. We have the knowledge, we have the tools. We need this government and this parliament to deliver. Thank you. The last of the open speeches is Mark Ruskell. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I join members in thanking Angus Macdonald for bringing forward this important debate. Um, I'd also like to congratulate the over 50 organisations who've collaborated to produce this timely report, including the staggering figure that it took over 7.5 million hours of volunteer time uh, to produce the data. That's a, that's a big twitch, a big birdwatch. Um, now, the intrinsic value of our nature is truly beyond measure, and we should never deny future generations the opportunity to witness the miracles of this garden planet. But what's also clear is that the future of our human society is inextricably linked to the health of the natural world. The environment provides us in Scotland with free services worth around £20 billion a year. Services to our economy, because without pollinators there's no agriculture, without peat bogs, forests and wetlands there's no carbon storage, healthy habitats keep our air clean and our water stored in the landscape. But our natural backbone faces major threats in Scotland, from climate change habitat fragmentation, unsustainable grazing, diffuse pollution, poorly located developments, invasive non-native species, and unsustainably managed marine resources and land management practices. But when we think about the twin global threats we face of climate change and biodiversity loss, it's clear that we have a monumental opportunity to rethink our exploitative relationship with nature. We can think in new ways that connect us back to the limits of the planet we live in, while recognizing that a diverse, healthy environment holds carbon and cushions us all from the environmental shocks far better than a degraded one. And to start this transformation, we need a better understanding of the health of nature. So a comprehensive set of ecosystem health indicators would give us the dashboard to understand the state of not just protected species, but the wider environment. So for example, soil erosion is an indicator on that dashboard that's clearly entering the red zone. Soil erosion undermines our ability to store carbon and to support soil biodiversity, but it also undermines our very ability as a society to maintain our food production in a way that can resist the extremes of climate and weather. Now, farms can and should also provide some of the connecting habitats for a national ecological network, which Dave Stewart has already uh, mentioned, um, allowing species to move freely across landscapes along nature's highways, adapting to changing climates, and also sustaining the genetic health of their populations. Now, we, all, we already have the Central Scotland Green Network identified in the National Planning Framework as a key infrastructure priority, and I think it's now time to expand this approach, because ecological networks can do more than create space for nature. They can help connect our urban spaces with the surrounding countryside. And when green spaces are part of our urban environment, they bring all the benefits for our mental and physical health, creating spaces for reflection, walking the dog, or teaching a child to ride a bike. And while they also define our local landscapes and our sense of place in so many of our communities. And that's perhaps why loss of greenbelt is such a defining environmental issue in so many communities in Scotland today. Around Stirling, where I live, greenbelt campaigns dominate concerns whether it's the campaign to prevent quarrying on the much-loved Gillies Hill, Graham's Dairy's persistent attempts to build on the iconic Airthry Curse, to the Judy Murray-fronted executive housing development at Park of Keir. Communities have been fighting greenbelt battles, in some cases, for generations to protect the integrity of their places. And councils have reflected these concerns in democratically agreed local development plans. When ecological networks, such as the CSGN, are reflected in those plans, then they should be a hard backstop against inappropriate development. But until our green belt and ecological networks are given the status that a national infrastructure priority should afford them in the planning system, we will always see the value of capital receipts triumph over placemaking, particularly when developments come to appeal. So, presiding officer, let's ask the question, what can we do for nature, but also ask the question, what can nature do for us? And in answering that, we may find a way forward to halt biodiversity loss 
make our places resilient to climate change, and reconnect us to nature. I now invite Paul Wheelhouse to wind up this debate. Uh, around seven minutes, please, Minister. Thank you. Uh, I congratulate An Angus Macdonald on securing this debate and thank all members for their excellent and thoughtful contributions. It has been a welcome opportunity for us to debate um, Scotland's biodiversity and to consider the overall health of our natural environment. And I do remember well launching the biodiversity strategy with Angus Macdonald at the Jupiter Centre, and it is a wonderful oasis of, uh, of wildlife within an otherwise industrial landscape. So I'll certainly recommend that uh, Rosanna Cunningham does visit in her capacity as Cabinet Secretary. Um, I am pleased to be able to, to contribute to this debate on behalf of the Cabinet Secretary, who uh, members have noted is, is unable to attend this debate just now. But climate change is, of course, a, a real and present threat to biodiversity, as a number of members have, have mentioned today, and an issue which this Scottish Government uh, recognises a very real and pressing uh, challenge. And that is why we are making every effort to tackle climate change, the decarbonisation of energy being just one example of the difference uh, we can make. So I think it's important uh, that other ministers, including the Cabinet Secretary, do play their role in, in supporting biodiversity uh, in, in Scotland, and clearly through the energy portfolio, I hope to do that. But Claudia Beamish uh, mentioned the positive work of uh, the MPAs, uh, Marine Protected Areas and Marine Planning. Uh, but without action on climate change, we will not achieve our goals in biodiversity. Diversity. And I think, just to cite one example, um, an article from uh, December of 2015 in the, in the Guardian around the decline in uh, uh, seabirds in St Kilda, particularly kittiwakes and puffins, pointed out that RSPB, uh, Dr Paul Walton, who many may know, um, pointed out this data from St Kilda is really extremely worrying. We're losing whole colonies of these birds now, and it's a very serious issue. Frankly, it breaks my heart. It really does. He goes on to say there's a very strong climate change link here that needs to go straight to Paris. What they decide there is going to determine the future of our seabirds. We're clear on what the science is saying, that really big ecology effects of climate change are unfolding in the marine environment around Scotland right now. It's coming, it's here now. And I think he is absolutely right to highlight that we are seeing the impacts of climate change. That's why it's so important that we maintain our commitment to, to Paris uh, Agreement. And indeed, I, I hope um, that we are doing our bit in Scotland. But um, Dave Stewart and Mark Ruskell have mentioned green corridors. I certainly recognise the point in terms of helping species adapt to climate change, to allow them to move to new areas to, to, to escape the effects of climate change in effect. That is very important, and I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary will, will note the remarks about the importance of uh, ecological network. Uh, like Angus Macdonald and Mark Ruskell, I'm, I'm also very grateful to the Consortium of Conservation and Research Organisations who have come together to share their knowledge and expertise in preparation of the State of Nature Report 2016. And the report highlighted the successes we have made and some of the challenges ahead. Scotland's natural uh, heritage is celebrated across the world. Here in this part of the globe, we are fortunate to have some stunning species and habitats. And who can fail to be moved by the agility of an Arctic skua or, or indeed a hen harrier uh, or wonder at the beauty of the macher, the macher in uh, full bloom? However, uh, the debate is often characterised by a focus on uh, the uh, more charismatic larger species, the fauna, and it's been actually very helpful today, I think, to hear a number of members talking about the, the wider ecosystem impacts on biodiversity as well. And we must be careful, of course, not only to think in terms of Scotland's iconic species, the health of the wider ecosystem is also of crucial importance, and without the complex colonies of plants, marine ecosystems, bryophytes, and fungi, we would not have many of those I iconic species in place, and all biodiversity is of course important. Um, and, and if we look at ecosystem services, the point I think Mark Ruskell was referring to, we know that green prescriptions can be in many cases far more effective than uh, conventional therapies. And of course, as Angus Macdonald put it, um, action on biodiversity is essential to prevent species and habitat loss entirely. And I think that in its own right, that uh, is an aim that we should all aim to achieve. And of course, nature-based tourism is estimated to account for as much as 40% of tourism spending in Scotland. So it's, uh, it's also very good for the economy. But like some of the members here today, and I, I'm uh, indeed um, focusing on what Graham Day had a, a member's debate last week on species champions, I'm also concerned at the decline in some of Scotland's iconic species too. And this Scottish Government is determined that we'll tackle the issue of biodiversity loss. And that is why we are committed to delivering the goals of the UN Convention of Biodiversity as expressed in the HE targets uh, to 2020. And this international obligation underpins both the Scottish biodiversity strategy and the route map to 2020. Uh, and Claudia Beamish um, is unable to, to hear this, but uh, I just want to sort of outline some of the steps we're taking to uh, achieve the HE targets. The route map sets out the actions needed to meet those international obligations. And in September, Scottish Natural Heritage published two progress reports. 
The first of these reports detailed the work underway on the actions in the route map, and nearly 80% of those actions are on track to achieve or exceed their targets by 2020. The second report assesses whether Scotland is on track to meet the HE targets 2020 themselves, and I'm pleased to say that good progress is being made towards meeting our international obligations, although further data is awaited in order to properly assess some of the targets. I'm also pleased to see that Scotland is again at the forefront of shouldering uh, responsibility by being the only devolved administration to have yet begun to directly assess our country's progress towards meeting the HE targets. And of course, there are areas which require more work, and uh, we'd acknowledge that. And one of the reasons why we commissioned the work from SNH is to give us a clear picture of the issues which require further attention or indeed increased effort. And, and Morris Golden touched on a number of concerns he had in that respect. But we understand they have more work to do in some areas and we are focusing on that challenge. Now, I know that uh, some, including Graeme Day, have commented that there appears to be a disparity between the State of Nature report and the SNH progress reports. So I think it, uh, we need to be clear that these reports are showing two different things, and, and I know Graeme Day is, is aware of this. My understanding is that the State of Nature report provides us with a snapshot of the current situation set against the historical background. And in some cases, as members have said, comparing the situation now with the 1970s. And there's considerable value in this type of approach because it shows us the extent to which we're making progress or not against the historical context. And I, I, I certainly noted the point that Graeme Day referred to the report going to the Cabinet Secretary on, on this issue from the committee. However, the SNH progress reports are looking forward and estimating our progress towards the 2020 targets and goals I referred to a few moments ago. And the SNH reports provide an estimate of Scotland's position in 2020. And this is a very different thing, uh, and we need to be careful not to compare apples and pears. But early next year, we'll be laying before this Parliament the fourth report de detailing progress on the implementation of the Scottish Biodiversity Strategy. Reporting will cover the period to 2014 to 2016 and is a requirement of the Nature Conservation Scotland Act 2004. And the previous report to Parliament identified areas for further action and led to the Scottish Government and key delivery partners, including many of those organisations who have developed the State of Nature report, working together to develop the route map and hope that similar collaborative effort will accompany the next stage of delivery for biodiversity. We've heard in the Chamber today about a range of biodiversity matters and I'm pleased to see the enthusiasm and commitment of my colleagues across the Chamber. We have all have a part to play in delivering more for biodiversity. I'd like to highlight the contribution made by many of our land managers, as John Scott has done, uh, towards uh, protecting and enhancing biodiversity in a, in a world where we require ever increased uh, intensity of agricultural production as well. So, for example, around 40% of our farmland, farmland is managed under a high nature value farming system, including crofting that Dave Stewart referred to. And many farmers in other areas of Scotland are benefiting uh, biodiversity by participating in the agri-environment climate scheme. Um, it's easy to focus on the negative and to ignore that we have made enormous progress for biodiversity in Scotland. And I'm a glass half full kind of person. And I think we need to celebrate success and use that to motivate us all to achieve more. And there were some good examples raised by Graeme Day in relation to uh, work on conservation of golden eagles and indeed changes in terms of muirburn practices. So there is good work going on. We just need to do more of that to engage our energies collectively to achieve more for Scotland's biodiversity. So in conclusion, uh, presiding officer, we have a long and successful history of partnership working in Scotland. Indeed, we rely on many of our NGO partners to help us to deliver the route map actions and indeed we depend on land managers as well uh, to, to help facilitate that. Scotland has a wonderful natural heritage. It is a source of great nation, national pride. It's also a source of natural capital for our economy. And biodiversity supports much of our food and drink industry, as John Scott also referred to. It generates significant income from tourism. It under, underpins our image abroad, and some say it actually defines our image abroad in many ways. So Scotland is a breathtaking in its beauty. It's extraordinary in its complexity and it's singular in its importance to the people of Scotland's uh, biodiversity. So I urge you to support the work underway to deliver against the 2020 targets and I call on those who can make a difference for biodiversity to do just that. But it's clear from the sentiment around the chamber that we have a strong group of very committed members in this chamber trying to help support nature conservation and I very much welcome that. Thank you very much. I close this meeting.